Hey there everybody, this is Mark from MGCPuzzles.com and CustomMadePuzzles.com. Today I wanted to just cut a fun puzzle for you folks, uh, kind of do it for the most part start to finish in a single take. Uh, I'm imagining this is going to take about 30 to 35 minutes. Uh, this should be approximately a 100 piece puzzle, maybe a little bit less. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of color line cutting in here around some parts of the flowers and some of the stamps. This is sort of like French wallpaper that's just been uh, traced into the outline of a beautiful butterfly. So I hope you guys like the image. I think it's pretty darn attractive and uh, definitely makes uh, for a wonderful puzzle subject. In the sake of trying to save us several minutes of time, I have decided to take uh, this puzzle and voila, we've already trimmed it out. So it's uh, been sculpted and uh, traced out of the side here. So we're gonna take this beautiful butterfly and we're gonna turn it into a very challenging adult style puzzle with little tiny pieces. Uh, again, I'll do a little bit of color line cutting around the roses here and a couple of the leaves, but for the most part, uh, I think it'll just make a really wonderful puzzle. So I'm gonna use my cell phone today, uh, doing a single take using that because I've been having some trouble with uh, sound on the OBS uh, system with the multiple cameras. Uh, when I want to play music, so I'm in the mood to listen to some music, so I'm going to uh, Go ahead and play music with my iPhone today. You guys will be able to enjoy it. This is royalty-free uh, Music so these artists have donated their their music to uh, YouTube and Twitch on their Spotify channel and uh, We can listen to the art while making videos without any kind of uh, uh, copyright or royalty penalty, so I'm going to zoom in for you folks, bring in my, saw my, my camera just a little bit closer. And let's get nice zoom in there for you. All right, I hope that's a good angle. Now, pardon the shake, just trying to get it situated. Once I do that, we're all set. Hopefully you can hear me okay over this. reading glasses here for a second. I like seeing crystal clear when I cut. Not bad for uh, royalty free music, huh? For those of you who don't like my choice of music, I, uh, I apologize, but this is my shop, so. Please just kindly turn down the uh, volume if a particular song doesn't uh, resonate with you. I do try to pick music that I think most people will enjoy. It's kind of nice when we all can sit here and watch the videos and kind of thump away with our fingertips as we're watching. Sure beats the monotonous sound of this saw. that are new to my videos, uh, you'll notice that no, there are no templates being used here. I do completely freehand cut my puzzles. The only exception being is when I occasionally will stencil a shape piece to personalize the puzzle. And I'll probably do a couple of them here in this puzzle. I'm not a fan of doing a whole bunch.
for those of you who are looking for uh, cool imagery to cut into puzzles, you hobbyists or just kind of wanting something fun, uh, wallpaper does make uh, great material. Find some really cool wallpaper patterns or even sometimes screensaver patterns that you can get very large digital files online and uh, kind of draw or trace an outline that you want to follow, like in this case of this butterfly, and then use the pattern on the wallpaper as your, uh, your source of uh, art to entertain your puzzle solvers. Sometimes you'll see me disappear briefly from cutting because as I cut my puzzles, I do like to reassemble them as I go. And believe it or not, occasionally I stump myself. So it takes me slightly longer to reach over and put a piece into place. In last night's video, you got to see my assistant solver make her debut in my shop on video. Having somebody here to assist is, uh, is definitely nice. In that, uh, number one, the company is always nice, but also speeds me up. I can uh, just focus on cutting and placing the piece down next to me and uh, not taking those three to seven or even 10 seconds to put the piece in place in the puzzle, which technically from a production point of view is uh, a slowing process. I've had a couple of people ask me about my wood and want to know where they could uh, buy it from. And I don't know where to tell you to get it from in small quantities because my supplier is a wholesale distributor that imports and sells in very large quantities. When I buy my wood, I purchase approximately one ton of it at a time. And just the shipping alone is about 400 US dollars. So not sure that my supplier is gonna be of much help to much of anyone. But I did have the idea of maybe when I place my next order, I can uh, put a little bit of extra wood on that order and when I get it, possibly rip it down into 24 inch by 36 inch or maybe just 24 inch by 24 inch boards and uh, sell it to some of you hobbyists that would like to give it a try. If you buy maybe like three or four sheets of it, it probably won't break the piggy bank at two foot by two foot size for shipping. And you can find out if you like it. See, there we go. I just got, oh, all right, now I know why. <laughs> got a little lost over there myself. come across here real quick and cleanly section this into two halves. I'm afraid of uh, this big pointy bottom of the wing here if I give it too much uh, friction with my fingers. I don't want to cause any potential image lifting even though my paper is extremely durable and my laminate as well but if you uh, you over abuse uh, the edge of a puzzle piece all papers eventually will split. So I think since we're cutting a butterfly, we should put a butterfly pattern into here. And had I prepared that a little bit ahead of time, that probably wouldn't would have been good. But let me just quickly look through my 
my pattern and uh, see if I can quickly find one of my butterflies. So, pardon the delay there. I've been doing puzzles for 24 years, so I have a lot of patterns. I was just thinking the other day, I, I can't get over how many sheets of I have at this point. All right, found it, not too bad, halfway through. So we're gonna go with, uh, I don't know. Let's, let's do a, uh, a compound one right there. We're gonna do that one. I think I have enough room, not in this little chunk, but in the other chunk. That's a fun little butterfly to carve. So I cover vid this personalization feature in a, in a video dedicated to it about a week ago in the video uh, thumbnail if you want to look for it in my library I'm holding up a sheet of something like this it has it has some shapes on it in the thumbnail so look for that one and it's a really great watch it's a long video but I really kind of go into a lot of detail about how to apply figurals and or whimsies for you folks in uh, England and Northern Europe that's what you guys call them but I show you how to apply them and the different kinds and different ways to to enjoy them in a puzzle. All right, so we are going to now come over here and see if this fits in just two two pieces. And yeah, marginally does. So I just want to make sure I'm not running the butterfly off any edges here. All right, so what we do is I really don't trace cut any of the cuts in there. That's just a visual reference for me to know that that's what I want to really do with this puzzle back in the day when I was still a young cutter. I've literally been cutting this particular butterfly into puzzles since probably around 1999 or 2000. Now this right here with the antenna is an interesting thing I do and I'll show you what exactly I mean by that when I get to that point. So there we go, we have the butterfly outline and it's pretty clean and crisp. And the way that works is this is a heavy duty mylar kind of tracing paper and I have pencil graphite on both sides so as you trace one side onto my special paper which I talk about in that video I mentioned earlier the carbon graphite transfers transfers over so now let's come on in here and cut this I sell this particular puzzle, by the way, in my my Etsy store, and this very one that I'm cutting for this video will be listed. I'll uh, know the piece count shortly afterwards and put it in the uh, description. So if anyone watching this, this video would actually like to purchase it, you are more than welcome to do so. And on a side note, those of you now that have been watching me for a little while, especially you hobbyists that would like to try to cut your own puzzles, I was thinking that uh, it would be probably a good idea, and not that I'm a salesman kind of person, because I'm definitely not, but for you to acquire one of my smaller puzzles so that you physically have one to compare your own cutting to and see how clean the cut is and how curvaceous it is, etc., in your own hands and see how they go together and it would be very uh, informative to your development as a, as a puzzle cutter. So, just an idea. You can probably get a nice $75 to $150 puzzle from me and, and gain a lot of knowledge from that. So I'm gonna come in here. And I also talked in my, some of my other videos that I don't always worry about following the line of a figural precisely. And the reason why I say that is the blade tends to, if you if you maintain pressure, and by the way, I'm gonna leave that for now. If you maintain a nice, steady, even pressure, your blade will give you a truer arc and curve than what you might hand draw or even trace. So if I deviate from a cut line while engaged in a curve, I tend to not worry about it in the slightest bit and just go with it. And then 
tried to actually intentionally deviate on the opposing side of the figure if there's some sort of a mirroring situation going on, much like this butterfly actually has. So there we go now, we have a nice little butterfly. And I'm gonna take that away for a second. We're gonna come back over here to the antenna. So this works really, really well if you're gonna have a, a solid area within your image, but I come in and I carve my antenna like so. And I carve it into the opposing piece. Now the key thing here is to realize that you have done this. Remember that you have done it and not accidentally. Now cut through those lines when you go back to cutting your puzzle. You wanna actually try to envelop that antenna into its own puzzle piece entirely. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna enter over here on the reverse side. I'm gonna cut an interlock down in between here and then wrap up over again and cut another interlock. So it'll be an interlock to the side and to the side and one within. So here we go. See the back side, the roughness of it, but you'll see that we cut two interlocks and one in. And now that will kind of accent on the other side when you solve the puzzle and you look at a little bit of a reflective glare, which my, my laminate is a little bit uh, anti-reflective, but uh, it's not glossy. However, looks really kind of nice, I think, and it accents the piece quite nicely. So when you come in here and you put the two together, See? So now we're going to cut this, take the tape off. We're going to carve this one large butterfly into seven pieces. The body is going to contain one piece, and then the wings will be three each. and the body. And again, now that almost doesn't even look like a butterfly body, but once you solve it, you'll find that it is. And it connects quite nicely with the, uh, with the antenna right there, see? All right, so let's carve these wings up. Don't worry, I won't cut myself. I'm extremely adept to, uh, to the blade. I can even touch it a little bit and we're all good. I dance with this blade. I've been cutting on this saws for over 30,000 hours of experience. So it's not to say that the blade doesn't bite me once in a blue moon. It's no big deal. It's not a tool to be terribly afraid of when you have such a incredibly fine blade on it. Now there are blades I would be deathly afraid of making a silly mistake on. I'm gonna give you a quick comparison. So I'm gonna just bring a little white background over here for a second so you can kind of see the difference. So this is the blade that I'm currently cutting with. And you can probably just make out the teeth in there. There's 33 teeth per inch, and that is an extremely fine blade. But this is the blade I use if I wanna take down a piece of two by four. And as you see, tremendous difference. This one will not take your finger off, that one will. All right, so now we have our 
butterfly completely carved out. Oop, helps to see, I'll just put it down here and pick it up straight away. There we go. So, and it's lovely is that this compound piece is nobody realizes initially that there's a butterfly in the puzzle until they get that section completed. So, there we go. All right, now back to cutting. I'm trying to think of what the next big girl in the butterfly should be. And since it's a French scene and very colorful floral, I'm thinking on the other side, we need to, uh, we need to put in a hummingbird. What do you think? And the hummingbird, I think we're going to do an enhanced figural. And I'll show those of you who don't know what that is, what that is. Enhanced figurals are really quite beautiful. Again, most enjoyed when cut into an area that's of a solid color. This image is not the ideal image, but you get the point when you see it. I did it myself again, got lost. <laughs> Always cracks me up. I'd like to give a quick shout out to Steve Good. He's been uh, very nice to uh, include me in his scroll saw workshop blog about four times in the last 10 days. Been uh, enjoying some of his uh, blogs myself about some of the projects he works on and things he does. Had a couple of nice phone calls with him over the last two, two weeks or so as well. Really nice guy. So, thank you, Steve. And thanks for everybody that follows Steve coming over here and being kind enough to subscribe to my channel. Hope I'm able to advance your 
your scrolling skills a little bit and giving you some fun ideas for jigsaw puzzle making at the very least. And don't be afraid to turn that wood. This blade is quite capable of turning ridiculously fast turns. If you uh, want to see a good example of that, watch my uh, my whimsy video that I made about a week ago. Or not a whimsy, I should say, doodle video. that green color line right there so if you look real careful you'll see that there's no green over here other than that little tiny speck of a leaf and that their green right there is quite sharp now watch what I do over that I'll come in here and very specifically now I'm gonna isolate this green out This blade is getting dull, so this will be the last piece for it. Even though I know it broke earlier, but let's get rid of that blade. I'm not, I'm not liking it. So you can see how I just kept that green isolated. Nobody will think to put those two pieces adjacent to each other until possibly very late in the puzzle solving. Oh, here we go. Kept the blade and still not liking it. So that blade is definitely coming out. Still listening to royalty or free music. I like it. Notice that piece here. Is that, let me back this camera out just a little bit more. So that piece there, notice how I kind of cut it and made it an exaggeratedly long edge piece. I like to give away some edge pieces occasionally as large areas of excitement for people when they see them, like, ooh, an edge piece. But I'm kind of devious about how I go about doing what I do next. So there's the end of this edge piece and there's the end of it over here. So I like to come in and totally mess with people. So that edge piece goes with this in order to even lock it into the puzzle. So it needs to come in over here. And now we're gonna come over here and we're gonna mess with this piece with cutting in over there. So now you come in here and you slide these together so in order for this edge piece to lock with what's over here, it needs this internal piece. Notice that the, the interlock is right there. And now I'll come in and cut in between here. And technically speaking, I could even do a double 
inner piece and that's that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to cut this other exaggerated edge piece. All right, so now, if you notice, these all go together. See how nice and clean that is right there? But we still need this to lock it all together. see this exaggerated edge piece here requiring that piece and that piece to connect this edge piece to this edge piece what do you think all right and we still got one more here So we have our butterfly halfway cut at this point. I'll show you progress. Let's we'll zoom out. So there we go. I'm going to use the reflective light to try to show you a little bit of. Oh, actually, we don't have it half cut. We've got this whole section down here we still need to cut up. So let's go ahead and do that. Anybody there have any questions that they're pondering in their mind? Uh, please write them in the comments area below. I'd love to hear what you're thinking or wondering or wanting to know. I can possibly address it in an upcoming video later this week or sometime soon. Pretty excited to see today that I'm up to 757 subscribers which means we're getting much closer to the 1,000 subscriber goal which will allow me to make uh, live broadcasts I'd really like to be able to directly interact with you if you're able to chime in when I am doing a live broadcast and I will mix up the time of day that I do them so that my friends over there in Europe or Asia will be awake and able to chime in early in the morning New York time or later at night New York time. One of the really cool things about the internet is it's a global, a global phenomenon that everybody from all over the world can participate and enjoy watching and sharing with each other. If you're wondering how thick my wood is, it's uh, one quarter inch thick, which is the equivalent of about seven millimeters thick. And I like it better than Baltic birch, which is from what I understand what what most people cut when they cut birch wood is the Baltic birch. I find that the Baltic birch has a much harder feel to it than Finland birch, and I don't know why that is, but as far as I'm concerned, 
it definitely is. And I also find that the Baltic Birch Manufacturing, I don't think that they have someone like me in mind because what they will do is on the inner layers of wood, they will occasionally put a piece of garbage wood in there and there'll be a large void or kind of a rotten knot or something. And when I cut their wood into small pieces, unlike a furniture maker, the, uh, the upper and lower part of the wood will literally just separate. And this is definitely not a cool thing when you're cutting a, a very large puzzle, especially with many hundreds, if not thousands of pieces to come across an area that's perhaps two inch by two inch or five centimeter by five centimeters in size, where suddenly your puzzle pieces are just disintegrating because there's an inner layer completely missing. And with Finland birch, although I have run across that, I have run across it significantly less frequently than when I used to cut birch or uh, Baltic birch myself. All right, so we're gonna definitely want to do preparation here for that hummingbird. So let's stick some tape down here. We're gonna get the hummingbird's beak to go right into that rose. So let me get my pencil. And so let's get the beak to go right there. That's our target for the beak. Or the, the bill. Uh, beak, I guess. <coughs> All right, once again, uh, bear with me. I need to find my hummingbird. Oh, look at that, second sheet, found it. All right, so. Now he looks pretty awful right now because I've used him many, many, many times. So lots of pencil tracings going on on this, this shape. Alright, oops, pardon that, didn't mean to bump the camera stand. So I'm just trying to accent the outer edge of the, the wing, kind of to show where the feathers would be. And then you got the nice relatively smooth body coming down to again some tapered tail wing and tail feathers. Again, following the actual cut lines, if you feel that you can artistically enhance it by deviating based on what you're visualizing, go with the blade. The pattern is just a general reference. It's not the Bible spoken that you gotta follow it to a T. And there we go, now we have our little hummingbird. But now let's show you how to make this an enhanced figure shape whimsy. But let me exit the wood first, so I'm gonna come out over here. I know I could release the top release and get my blade out, but I'm okay with traveling my way out of the wood. All right, so there we go, I got the two halves coming apart there. 
So now let's take our hummingbird and we're going to enhance it. So let's come in here and we'll do the tail first. enhances it like tail feathers and we'll do the same thing here don't have to come in very far the idea is easily picked up on if you just come in a I don't know maybe five six millimeters at most which is slightly less than a quarter inch bird with a nice pointy beak and it goes right into the rose and he's getting his little nectar out of there notice how he just kind of disappears nice and clean almost not visible that's one of the other very very lovely things about hand cut puzzles in comparison to the modern laser made puzzles is the cut lines are not dark like laser goes through and actually burns away the material it doesn't cut anything it, it's it's laser burned and it leaves a dark residue on top and I don't like that at all I like the true artistic qualities of a one-of-a-kind handmade puzzle And yes, all this music continues to be royalty free. So now I'm listening to some, some jazz blues music. And so what I like to do here is, if you look the edge of that wing of that hummingbird, this ripple is quite obvious. So instead of making this into multiple pieces, which then makes two or three or four pieces very easy to put into the outer edge of the hummingbird. I just give them the entire amount of it in a single piece. So uh, let's do that real quick. So there we go now, all of that ripple is in a single piece and yes they can quickly match it up to the hummingbird but then they're back at a loss for initially what's going to go right next to that in there and it doesn't look like that goes next to the hummingbird or touches the hummingbird at all does it but it does and then now here we have a perfect opportunity so we have this very sharp contrasting line of the, uh, the rose petal and the, and the green leaf in such a way that the leaf looks like it would technically have something matching up to it that's green so I'm gonna come in here and purposely uh, mess with you guys whoever might own this puzzle someday by cutting along that color line. And once again, I'm giving away all of that rippled edge right there for the hummingbird. I'm giving it away in one piece, and yet they're thinking that that's gonna be connecting to more of the rose, and it's not. And then you always have to come across real quick and, and attack that other area that's the opposing piece and carve it away so that you don't chop it up into too many fine pieces, giving it a reveal too early going. So 
Now here I go, I'm gonna come in here and carve that away. So that entire edge right there is that color line cut. And I'm gonna make whoever solves this think that, for the most part, this piece needs green around it. See that, there's very little to give it away that there's not more green over here, but we know that there's definitely a rose on top of it. come in here from the edge as well. We'll do a little bit of a color line cut. Try to keep this little bit of this yellow out of that other figure over there. And again, you probably wouldn't think that that's edge right there, but it is. Grab me nuts again. Starting to ping and pop. So apparently this video isn't going to be just 30 or 40 minutes long. It's going to be more like, uh, I don't know, an hour or five minutes long because we still got about 30% of the puzzle to go. This little chunk right here is still what remains. And you can see our hummingbird there. Riding right along that leaf right there. Nice little mini color line cut. I call that a micro color line cut. look like it. I'll show you that last piece real quick. So you can see how it goes right into the back of the hummingbird there. And now we're going to come out here and we're going to disguise that entire beak area. So I'm going to look at the hummingbird and say, oh, let's find the piece that that beak connects into. Well, guess what? Now with my puzzle. Now 
that piece right there is where the beak is. You can kind of see the curve a little bit, but only you and I know that that's a beak piece. When you spill all the puzzles pieces out of the box onto the table, you don't just look at that and say, oh, that goes next to the beak. Again, kind of like taking advantage of this area here being mostly yellow, and now it's going against the predominantly, almost entirely red rose area, pink rose. Coloring, by the way, here in the shop doesn't jump out quite as well as it is in real life, but good enough. This rose is kind of like a, a pinkish red, and I think on camera, it almost looks borderline a little bit on the orange side there. Hmm. Stuck myself again. All right, we are getting there. Now we're just down to this little piece right here. And this puzzle actually has a decent amount of uh, pieces and trickery in it that I am actually going to go ahead and put my special identifying signature piece into this puzzle. And my signature piece is a, uh, a child wearing a, a ball cap, a baseball cap. There we go. Got it in a variety of sizes. So this identifies me as the maker of the puzzle to anyone out there that follows and knows the jigsaw puzzle world. And all the uh, more famous puzzle makers over the years have had their pieces. For example, par puzzles, which made puzzles from around 1930 until about 1972. They used a uh, seahorse as their identifier. Not to say that other people didn't cut seahorses into their puzzles, but theirs were rather unique. And there was two guys that made those puzzles. So if there was one seahorse in it, then you'd know that only one of them actually worked on cutting the puzzle. But occasionally you'll find two seahorses in a puzzle. And that means that they both worked on cutting part of that puzzle. Kind of interesting little phenomena. I have a very interesting little thing about my figural or my signature piece that as far as I know doesn't exist with any other cutter in modern day or historically and that is if my uh, my shape piece like this my, my signature piece is facing to the right like it currently is in this puzzle it means that I personally picked out the puzzle image or it was a puzzle image that was available for my customer to select on my website 
and therefore I was personally involved with the choice of image. But if I turn around and I cut the shape facing to the left, that means that I had nothing to do with the choice of the image in that puzzle. That was strictly my client or customer's choice. And uh, it still identifies me as the maker, but it also points out that the image choice had nothing to do with my input. And once again, you don't necessarily need to follow the line so darn precisely. Just use them as a general guideline. I like to throw an interlock there, sort of like a, a little bit of tuft of hair sticking out from underneath the cap. And then I come down and do like a little bit of an upper, upper chest area, bust area. On the back of a signature piece, most cutters will, will initial it and or sign their name. Those of us that number puzzles like I do, we tend to uh, write additional information onto the puzzle. And this piece is not wanting to cooperate with me there. Let's get rid of that. why that tape was not very adhesive there. That's unusual. And there we go. We have the child wearing a baseball hat side profile. And again, facing to the right because I personally picked this image to make this particular puzzle. All right, so we're gonna work up from the bottom here and kind of wrap this puzzle up. And then I'll do a nice little slow motion flyover so you guys can kind of check out all of the individual cuts of the completed puzzle. And again, once I uh, sand this puzzle and, and count it and box it, I will uh, put that information in the description area below. And if anybody would like to purchase this puzzle, they can do so in my Etsy store, which I will enclose a link as well. And I'll take this minute to ask those of you who are new to my channel and perhaps finding this video as your introduction to me, Please uh, click on that little red button down below and subscribe to my channel. And uh, if you'd like to be alerted to upcoming posts and or live broadcasts, after you click the subscribe button, click on that bell and select all. And that will send you a message when I uh, put up new material. And then if you like this particular video, please uh, mouse over that thumbs up button and give me a like. It's appreciated very much. Uh, YouTube uses those uh, likes to rank videos and give them additional exposure. And videos that are have a high like ratio apparently get, uh, get more viewers over time. So you'll be helping me out by giving me that like. So thank you very much for those of you that do that. Clicking on that like button helps me get more exposure, which helps me and also help you. Hey, 
All right. Gets kind of tricky here sometimes. I gotta come in with my own alternate uncut part to figure out what I need to what I need to grab to lock the edge pieces together. That's another reason I do like to reassemble my puzzles as I cut them, so you can prevent an unnecessary long distance seam from occurring. A seam being uh, in kind of a, a lot of pieces in a row that don't interlock with each other that kind of create a large crack, so to speak, in the puzzle. This is uh, something that an advanced puzzle cutter, generally speaking, never lets happen. Although there are times I intentionally create them. If I'm cutting like an Americana folk art print and there's a house in it with a, a long roof line, I might ride the blade four or five inches along that roof line without creating any interlocks. And the purpose of which is to create the impression of edges on the puzzle. And yet that area is actually within the puzzle. So it's kind of a, a trick maneuver to stump people to lining that stuff up as an edge area only to find out later on that it's nowhere near the edge. For the most part, I'm actually a very nice person, but when it comes to making my puzzles, I do take personal pleasure out of, out of tormenting people. done here super 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 close how many of you have cringed that my blade is this close to the puzzle uh, or my the blade is my fingers are this close to the blade I'm curious Once again, in the front of my figural, the face there, I'm going to go ahead and give that away in one piece. Giving somebody that moment of like, oh, I got an easy one. Yep, you're only getting one easy one. Same with the uh, hummingbird. These are the last two pieces of the puzzle. I'm gonna bring, oh shucks, actually. I stand corrected yet again, just like last time. I have a little piece.
still at the tip here. With these puzzles that have a bit of uh, something going on and it disguises the blades pretty well and the cuts. There's times I go and take a puzzle into the sanding room only to flip it over and realize, oh gee whiz, there is a whole section here I overlook cutting. And back to the saw I go. Sometimes that area could be as small as 20 or 30 pieces and sometimes it's actually wound up being even in the vicinity of 100. Seems like I made more of a, a talking video this time than a musical one like I thought I was going to make when I first started. There we go, almost done. Last two cuts. And actually, you know what? No, just, I'm going to keep that intact. This piece is, it might be just a hair on the larger side, but. If I cut that in half, the pieces would be too small. Right, let me think about that for a minute. Now, right, you know what? I think the pieces will be all right. Let's do that. Perfect. A touch small, but not unacceptably so at all. So there we go. And now we have officially finished cutting the puzzle. So let me just hit that with a duster and uh, put it on something. I'm going to back you guys out here so you can see what it is I have created. Oh, I didn't realize my uh, stand there was so prominent displayed. All right, let me get a little board here. Slide this off. And bring it into your view. So there we go. And you know what would be better? I'm gonna put it down over here and just pick up my phone and give you the flyover. Here we go, everybody. So we can zoom in and and so all of these little curly things you see on the back side there. When I go into the sanding room and I hit that with some of my sandpapers, that will all completely disappear. This back of this puzzle is going to look absolutely mint. Takes about, uh, I don't know, a puzzle this big, maybe about four or five minutes to give it a proper sanding. And then it's ready to be hand counted piece by piece and put into a box. Well, for everybody that hung out with me the entire video, thank you for watching. Uh, we're at an hour and 10 minutes, so definitely not one of my shorter videos, but it is a beautiful little puzzle. And I hope you uh, enjoyed seeing how I put in a couple of figurals, the butterfly over here. And once again, we can kind of zoom in and show that to everybody. Right over that Paris postage stamp from 1912. And then we come over here and we look at that hummingbird kind of diving into that rose to get a nice snack. And then up here we have my signature piece of the child wearing a baseball hat. There we go. So, a beautiful Parisian wallpaper art butterfly puzzle. 
Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm going to sign off now, and uh, we'll catch you in the next one. Have a great day.